Beethoven's Fifth Symphony has long been associated with war and defiance. In our times, those opening bars in particular, hammered chords which happen to coincide with the Morse code for V, V for victory. The defiant gesture adopted by Churchill and the call sign broadcast to occupied Europe in the Second World War. A sign daubed at huge personal risk by resistance fighters in defiance of Nazi occupation. The symphony was probably the most often played concert music on both sides in that struggle. But these defiant associations are not new. The music has its origins in an earlier period when all Europe was similarly engaged in a great conflict. Then too, the Fifth Symphony embodied the defiance of people enduring the horrors of war. This vast plain stretches all the way from Czechoslovakia, that's the hills in the distance there, about 30 miles away, and comes flat and uninterrupted down to Vienna at the base of those hills, another 15 miles. And just along this road is the little village of Wagram, which shot from obscurity to fame after two violent days in 1809. During the afternoon of July the 5th and throughout the following day, squadrons of cavalry wheeled about here trying to cut through or outflank the enemy. Wheeling on this perfect terrain for their manoeuvres, as flat as if it had been designed for some military board game. And at the end of the second day, there were more than 13,000 men dead in these fields, in the summer heat, among uncounted numbers of horses. The intruders were the French. Napoleon had his headquarters on this patch of rising ground here. And during the second night, the Austrian army slipped discreetly away, leaving Napoleon in command of the field. What made it worse, from the Austrian point of view, was that he'd done much the same thing just four years before, up the road in Czechoslovakia at Austerlitz. And on both occasions, he and his army occupied Vienna. Those idealists, such as Beethoven, who had welcomed the French because of their revolution, were now in rather a different frame of mind. An Austrian met Beethoven just two years after Wagram, and he wrote, it is well known that Beethoven has a violent hatred for the French, and is very German in his feelings. And this brought us close to one another. Napoleon, during his rise to power, had seemed to be the champion of democracy. But then, in a sudden change of tack, the great Republican had declared himself emperor. When news of this betrayal came, Beethoven in his fury had cancelled the dedication of his third symphony, the Eroica. On this manuscript of the symphony, the word Bonaparte has been erased so violently that the paper has been torn right through. The Austrian emperor, France, had in recent years been at war with the French Republic, defending himself and his kind from this newfangled threat to monarchy. Now he was confronted instead by a French emperor, a man of insatiable ambition, for whom a defeat of Europe's most ancient imperial family in Vienna would be a further triumph. Renewed conflict was inevitable. War broke out again in August 1805. The French armies swept east across Europe, outfighting and outmaneuvering the royalist states aligned against them. On November the 13th, Napoleon and his vanguard marched down this stretch of the Danube. On their way here, they had defeated an Austrian army. Vienna was undefended. After occupying the city, Napoleon made a brief excursion for the first of his two victories in the vast plain to the north. That one was Austerlitz, the battle that he was always most proud of. The rest of the time, he worked away at his new headquarters in Vienna, reorganizing Europe to suit himself. With a facade like that to frame the view from the bedroom window, this is the sort of place where anyone would feel at home who had recently crowned himself emperor. And Napoleon settled as of right in the Austrian emperor's palace of Schönbrunn. He'd been brought this far by the brilliance of his own leadership, but also by the force of French patriotism. Allons enfants de la patrie. Let us march, children of the fatherland. Now it's just a familiar line from the Marseillaise, but it was something new then. Previously, armies had marched for kings or for religion. But in recent years, the French had been fighting for the Republic, for the very idea of France herself. 
It was the beginning of our own modern era in which nationalism and patriotism have played so large a part. But nationalism in one nation soon causes nationalism in another. When the French, on behalf of La Patrie, marched into the Austrian Vaterland, then the Austrians in their turn experienced a rush of patriotism to the head. It's a feeling which artists can powerfully play upon, and Austria had the artists with the power to do so. Too bad I don't understand war as well as music. If I did, I would beat him. Beethoven said that to a friend when he was working on the Fifth Symphony. Of course, the music is more than a hymn in praise of defiance. Nevertheless, the two men to whom Beethoven dedicated it were known to be among the most ardent enemies of France. And contemporaries undoubtedly felt that this symphony reflected the patriotic fervor of the time. Like every other composer, Beethoven was a creature of his times. You can't see him in isolation. He knew the other music that was going on around him, at least until the very end of his life, when his deafness really compelled him to exist in isolation. In those early years of the 19th century, he was perfectly well aware of the music thrown up by the French Revolution, those big revolutionary hymns, big choral and orchestral works with a good deal of military music, wind music in them, composed by people like Gossek and Cherubini, and it, that vein is discernible in his own music, the representation of triumph in the finale of the Fifth Symphony, the grand outburst into C major, for example, when the trombones and the percussion and the piccolo come in, that's unmistakably tinged by French Revolution music. So is the last scene of Fidelio, which is, is of course a triumph for freedom, and above all, so is the finale of the Choral Symphony, the ode to joy or to freedom, whichever way you interpret it, set with military music as well, as a military march in the middle of it, that's certainly 
indelibly influenced by the music of the French Revolution. But revolutionary sentiments butter no bread, and Beethoven's finances had been much harmed by the effects of the war. Inflation had doubled prices, reducing the value of fees he received from publishers, while the crippling reparations demanded by the French in the peace settlement made wealthy patrons less inclined to pay for dedications. So Beethoven made a practical suggestion to the Royal Imperial Court Theatre. Beethoven's proposal was that he should compose one opera each year in return for a salary. It was rejected. Perhaps any board of directors may be excused for fighting shy of a contract with someone of Beethoven's erratic disposition. And he wrote to a friend that he could hope for nothing from the princely rabble who ran the theatres. But he soon had reason to be grateful to at least one member of that princely rabble, Prince Lobkowitz, whose name appears again on this rather grand document, which solved Beethoven's need for a steady income. It was prompted by an invitation from abroad, a most provoking invitation as far as Vienna's princes were concerned, because it came from a member of that most hated family, the Bonapartes. Napoleon made a habit of setting his relations up in conquered territories, and in 1807 he carved out of central Germany a new kingdom, and gave it to his youngest brother, the 22-year-old Jerome Bonaparte. The young king, showing great discrimination, determined to acquire Beethoven as his court musician. Jerome offered Beethoven a handsome salary for life, with an orchestra at his disposal, and his public duties limited to conducting each year some concerts, specified as being few and short. Beethoven rapidly put this offer to his own greater advantage, letting it be known in Vienna that he was thinking of accepting. Consternation, at any rate, in aristocratic musical circles. The Bonaparte family had robbed Austria of much land and much dignity, now, to take her latest musical genius as well at the height of his powers would be too much. The result was this document, a contract providing Beethoven with a salary for life higher than that offered by Jerome, to be guaranteed by Prince Lobkowitz, by Prince Kinski, and by his friend and pupil, the Archduke Rudolf, the youngest brother of the Austrian emperor, trumping the youngest brother of the French emperor. Beethoven later wrote proudly on the front of the document, received on the 26th of February, 1809, from the hands of His Royal Highness, the Archduke Rudolf. Beethoven had achieved what every artist dreams of, a guaranteed salary with no commitments. He was able to draw his money as long as he remained in Austrian territories. And, which would have astonished Mozart, there was no hint in his position of civility. Very much the opposite. His three aristocratic patrons specifically state in the document their conviction that worries about the necessities of life must not be allowed to inhibit Beethoven's powerful genius. During the elaborate to and fro over the contract, Beethoven had been writing a cello sonata, a work which, like nearly all Beethoven's music of this period, makes heroic demands on the performers. Beethoven dedicated it to a friend who was an amateur cellist, Baron Ignaz von Gleichenstein, who had acted as an intermediary during the negotiations.
Beethoven had hardly received the contract before his life was thrown once more into turmoil by a fresh outbreak of war. In a series of fiercely contested battles, Napoleon again beat the Austrians back to the gates of Vienna. But this time, the city was not going to be surrendered without a fight. On May the 11th, the siege began. Vienna was bombarded by French howitzers throughout the night and the next morning. Beethoven, who occupied rooms in the inner city, took refuge in the cellar of his brother Kaspar, covering his head with pillows. Haydn, now a frail old man of 77, refused to leave his house. During the bombardment, he kept his spirits up, so legend has it, by going from time to time to his piano to play the Austrian national anthem, composed by himself. When the French army entered the city, Napoleon set a guard of honour before Haydn's house. But Haydn never regained his strength. Less than three weeks later, he was dead. Trapped in this conflict, Beethoven wrote to his Leipzig publisher, The existence I had built up only a short time ago rests on shaky foundation. What a destructive, disorderly life I see and hear around me. Nothing but drums, cannons, and human misery in every form. Napoleon returned to Schönbrunn and set about drafting a treaty which would humble Austria, he thought, for good. And soon the ancient house of Habsburg agreed to a union which would have been considered utterly degrading a few years earlier. Napoleon was to acquire legitimacy for his upstart family by marriage to the emperor's daughter, Marie Louise. Back in Paris, his first wife, Josephine, was divorced. While Napoleon himself was still in Schönbrunn, he summoned the leading artists of the day to entertain. Beethoven was not summoned. But the day after Napoleon's departure from Schönbrunn, Beethoven conducted a charity concert for the poor. It included the Eroica, music in memory of a great man. The next few years were ones of mounting personal crisis for Beethoven. He increasingly shunned company, slipping away to the country, particularly around the spa village of Baden, 15 miles south of Vienna. By 1813, his creative output seemed to have virtually dried up. When a friend, Nanette Streicher, the wife of the piano manufacturer, found him at Baden that September, she reported that his state of mind was at the lowest ebb, and he had neither a decent coat nor a whole shirt. His deafness must partly explain this gloomy isolation but it seems likely that a crisis in his emotional life was another relevant factor. All these books on Beethoven, and countless others, contain a section speculating about his romantic attachments. And it may be that part of the reason for his depression that summer in Baden was that he'd passed a decisive moment in his invariably unsatisfactory love life. There are several fascinating mysteries about this period. One of them is his song, Andi Geliebte, to the loved one, the manuscript of which has the words added, given to me by the author on March the 12th, 1812. So, given perhaps to the loved one herself? And if so, to whom? And then there's the famous letter, 
which Beethoven wrote also in 1812 and which was found among his possessions after his death. It was intended for an unknown woman whom he refers to as his immortal beloved. And found at the same time were these two portrait miniatures of young women. Could it be that one of these was Beethoven's immortal beloved? This one was soon identified as Countess Giulietta Guicciardi, to whom Beethoven had dedicated the Moonlight Sonata. He was known to have fallen in love with her when she was only 16, and so she rapidly became the leading candidate for the role of immortal beloved. Others, with each of whom Beethoven had been involved, were the Countess Teresa Brunswick. Her sister, the Countess Josephine. Teresa Malfatti. Dorothea, Baroness von Erchtmann. The profusion of countesses and other titles in these names reflects the fact that Beethoven moved almost exclusively in aristocratic circles. He was surrounded by young noblewomen, eager to learn the piano from him, creatures who were often bewitching, but always, in sober fact, unobtainable. It may be that he was subconsciously attracted to women who were unobtainable, sensing that his genius would be ill at ease in a conventional married household. And that idea does seem to be supported by the latest research on the immortal beloved. In 1977, an American scholar, Maynard Solomon, proved beyond reasonable doubt that she must be this woman, Antony Brentano, who had not previously been even thought of as a likely candidate. This is an authenticated miniature of her. And this is the other of the two miniatures found among Beethoven's possessions. There does indeed seem to be a resemblance though that plays no part in Maynard Solomon's argument. Antony was married to Franz Brentano, a Frankfurt businessman who was a close friend of Beethoven's. And the love letter, though presumably never in fact sent in this form, was written when the Brentanos were about to leave Vienna for good, to live in Frankfurt. Beethoven's letter has all the confusion of lines written in passionate haste, and as such it's very hard to interpret. But Maynard Solomon goes beyond his factual identification of the immortal beloved into an area of fascinating speculation. He sees the letter as relating to a crisis, the imminent departure of Antony from Vienna, and he argues that she must have offered to leave her husband and to live with Beethoven. If he's right, then the confused tone of the letter reflects Beethoven's panic, when for the first time, and he was now 42, an ordinary lasting relationship with one of his adored unobtainable women, became against all the odds a practical possibility. The letter then becomes a tortured rejection of the immortal beloved. And in one of the few humdrum sentences in it, Beethoven writes, at my age I need a steady, quiet life. Could that be so in our relationship? Whatever the truth, Antony went to Frankfurt and never saw Beethoven again, but spent the later years of her long life collecting cuttings about him. And Beethoven went his own solitary way. Ironically, it was idealised love, the safer variety, which brought Beethoven back into the world at this time. Some years earlier, he had written an opera about a perfect woman. That was in more stirring times, the period of the Fifth Symphony. And he had given it the subtitle, Die Ehrliche Liebe, which means both married love and true love. Fidelia was revived in an altered version in 1814. The central character is the idealised wife, Leonora, who disguises herself as a man so as to rescue her husband, Floristan, who has been imprisoned for resisting tyranny. The evil prison governor is about to murder his noble prisoner, but Leonora is determined to protect her husband until the arrival of the Minister of Justice, whose approach will be heralded by the sounding of a trumpet.
When Fidelio had first been staged in 1805, during the French occupation of Vienna, it had failed. But the revival in 1814 was a great success. As a rescue opera, a form which was fashionable around the time of the French Revolution, it now again matched the popular mood. By 1814, Europe felt that it was being rescued from Napoleon. His downfall had begun in 1812, when he had marched into Russia. Although he captured Moscow, the Russians merely retreated further and waited for the weather to take its toll. Napoleon's armies were forced to retreat through a murderous Russian winter, losing half a million men. The Allies continued to harry the French until, in 1814, Paris fell and Napoleon was driven into exile, to be finally defeated a year later at Waterloo. During Napoleon's campaigns, an even greater proportion of France's young men were killed than in the trenches of the First World War a hundred years later. In the autumn of 1814, the victors gathered in Congress in Vienna, hoping to put Europe back together again as if the French Revolution had never happened. Cartoonists poked fun at the squabbles of the nations, all of them trying to grab as many of the spoils of victory as they could. On the coattails of the statesmen, the city filled with the heads of all the princely families of Europe and their hangers-on. Byron denounced the whole affair as a base pageant. Asked how the Congress was going, an Austrian field marshal replied, Going? It's not so much going as dancing. Part of the mood of general satisfaction was pleasure at the fate of Napoleon. Meanwhile, those who had gathered to put Napoleon in his place needed entertaining. Beethoven enjoyed a huge success with two opportunist pieces. One he had composed during the years of Napoleon's military decline, entitled Wellington's Victory. It included cannonades, fanfares, and a fugal treatment of the British national anthem. The other piece, this glorious moment, celebrated the Congress itself. 
Of the 11 public concerts which Beethoven managed to arrange for his own benefit during his lifetime, no fewer than five took place during 1814. He was able to put by a considerable sum of money which he used to buy bank shares. He himself, 45 now but seeming older and almost totally deaf, became one of the attractions of the Congress. His reputation was such that people who perhaps had never heard his music, or if hearing it may not have understood it, accepted as an article of faith that here was a genius, someone mysterious and remote. There was a deep irony here. The Congress, which occasioned Beethoven's greatest acclaim, also ushered in a world that would see the defeat of all his highest ideals. The end of Napoleon provoked a tinge of regret for lost dreams in thoughtful men of all nations. The English artist, Turner, a man extraordinarily like Beethoven, distant, uncouth, revered, passionate, caught that ambiguity well. He imagined Napoleon on an English beach during his final journey to a lingering death on St Helena, the lone figure, symbol rather than man, and the violent sunset, symbolising what? Spilt blood, encroaching night. <laughs> Beethoven's art became increasingly private after 1815. He turned again to the piano sonata and produced a series of works which must have seemed puzzlingly eccentric to his contemporaries. This, opus 111, is the last of them. Side by side are long, harsh fugues, moments of uneasy stillness, episodes of violent energy, prolonged trills, strange effects with the hands sometimes far apart, producing a curiously hollow resonance.
composer fully able to hear might have hesitated to write such strange sounds. If Beethoven heard them at all, other than in his imagination, it was only in a weird and distorted form thanks to specially made gadgets. To mitigate his deafness, he tried a variety of ingenious improvements on the traditional ear trumpet. The most sophisticated of these incorporated a brass sounding box, encasing the end of an ear trumpet long enough to rest on the piano. Like a tiny tin bath, this was intended to amplify the music, which would then be carried up the trumpet to his ear. At the other end, a headband was attached, so that he could sit at the keyboard with his hands free to play or write, rather like a modern telephonist. In the public life of Austria, the presiding and rather sinister genius was Count Metternich. He'd been extremely influential at the Congress of Vienna, after which Catholic Europe returned to the strictest religious orthodoxy. Vienna began to swarm with police informers, and back came the index of prohibited books, making, even in this new edition of 1819, no attempt to conceal the notorious implications. Beethoven was not himself in sympathy with the kind of music now applauded in Vienna. He described the style of Rossini's comic operas as suitable only to the frivolous and sensuous spirit of the times. And in such times there seemed to be no place for Beethoven. He rapidly fell from popularity. Even the young Schubert, though he would later revise his opinion, dismissed Beethoven's music as eccentric. It engenders in people, he said, feelings not of love, but of madness. An extra burden in Beethoven's life at this time was a long legal battle. One of his brothers had died, leaving a son by the name of Karl. Beethoven regarded Karl's mother as little better than a whore, and so fought her for the custody of her son, a responsibility for which he was himself totally unsuited. Unable because of his deafness to converse normally, Beethoven used conversation books, in which his guests scribbled down their remarks. He became increasingly difficult and reclusive. Yet a small but faithful circle of admirers kept his music alive. In November 1822, a letter arrived from St. Petersburg. It was from Prince Nicholas Galitsin, a cellist and connoisseur of Beethoven's music, who now asked him if he would compose one, two or three quartets, for which labour I will be glad to pay you what you think proper. He ended by not writing three, but, well, five and a half quartets. That in itself shows that he was thinking of writing music not simply as something to satisfy a need of society, but to satisfy a need within himself. There's a famous remark that he's alleged to have made to Ignaz von Schubertig, leader of the quartet that played his music. He said something like, I can't think of your blasted violin. Schubertig had complained about it being too difficult when I'm communicating with God. Beethoven wasn't concerned You've got to remember he's deaf at this stage and quite cut off from the world. Wasn't concerned with the ordinary limitations of life. He was writing music for himself and indeed he was doubtless thinking about writing for posterity too. And in other respects these quartets are quite unorthodox. They break away from the standard four movement form, or several of them do. One of them is in as many as seven movements all joined. And it begins in a very unorthodox fashion with a slow, very intense fugue. The actual inner texture of the works is quite different from usual, too. No longer clearly stated themes with accompanying parts, but a much more integrated kind of quartet texture with little motifs, tiny phrases worked into it. And the music is willful in a lot of ways, too. It veers from key to key, changes mood and tempo and rhythm in quite violent and unpredictable ways.
Beethoven's reputation may have given him some protection from the secret police. He explained to an admirer, if a sincere independent opinion escapes me, as it often does, they think me mad. But his conversation books reveal that informers spied on him, and he knew it. He railed against the nobility, the court, the emperor himself. He talked of this paralytic regime. Silence, the walls have ears, warned the small circle with whom he drank and talked politics. One of his friends remarks in a surviving conversation book, the censor has broken me down, and another follows in the very next entry. You have to emigrate to North America if you want to give your ideas free expression. One member of the group was indeed expelled from Vienna by the police. In 1824, an open letter was sent to Beethoven by some 30 of Vienna's leading music lovers, begging him to allow a performance of the latest masterpieces from his hand. The result was an extraordinary concert. The premiere not only of parts of the Missa Solemnis, but also of a symphony with choir, the Ninth Symphony. The writers of the letter, one of whose arguments had been that foreign art was taking possession of German soil, had been answered with untold riches. It was a full ten years since Beethoven had had a public concert for his own benefit. The great event was held here, in the Kantnertor Theatre, on the 7th of May, 1824. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony would be on anyone's list of the most expansive pieces of music ever written, those with the broadest horizons. And it's a moving thought that its great chords, expressing such high hopes for mankind, were conceived in this small room in Baden, in an Austria which was either in a petty, and repressive police state. Beethoven lived in these rooms for three summers in his early fifties, and the first performance of the Ninth Symphony gives a vivid image of the composer in these last years of his life. He insisted on conducting the work himself, even though he was by now totally deaf. In fact, the players were watching someone else who was discreetly beating time. But Beethoven was the conductor that the audience saw, and he had a disconcerting habit of crouching low on his stand when he wanted the orchestra to play quietly, and then rising dramatically up for a crescendo, a method of conducting which did have its comic side when he got out of time with the orchestra that he couldn't hear. And of course he couldn't hear the applause of the audience either. And there was one moment in that first performance when the soprano, Caroline Unger, had to touch him gently by the sleeve and point to the audience behind him before Beethoven turned and bowed to acknowledge their enthusiasm. They were applauding in the Ninth Symphony, a work which looked back over his entire creative life to make a monumental statement of all that he had stood for. There's some evidence that even in his twenties he'd planned to set Schiller's Ode to Joy, which is itself just a rather high-flown drinking song. But now he selected from it those verses which best expressed a great utopian ideal, one that had always inspired him, the brotherhood of man. And he introduces the theme and the choir in a very dramatic fashion. After a turbulent passage from the orchestra, the human voice breaks in for the first time with the words, O Freunde, nicht diese Töne. O friends, not these sounds. And then the choir, in pleasant harmony, comes in to sing of an imagined day when mankind, reconciled with God, should at last be united in an overwhelming sense of joy.
After Beethoven's death on the 26th of March, 1827, a great crowd estimated at more than 10,000 people assembled for his funeral in Vienna. Grillparzer wrote the funeral oration. He was an artist, and what he was, he was through art alone. Until his death he preserved a father's heart for his own people. Thus he was, thus he died, thus he will live for all time. Whenever the power of his works overwhelms you like a coming storm, then remember this hour and think. We were there when they buried him, and when he died, we wept.